All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to see you on this rainy afternoon, but still in Zoom land all together. And also welcome to our final Connect on the Quest for this school year. My name is Tracy Jansen. And in addition to serving as a first grade teacher at Kaiser Elementary in Kirkwood School District, I also co-chair the Green Schools Committee. Our incredible committee members have worked to plan this event for you this afternoon, which aligns with our focus of the year, Climate Action. We'd love for each of you to get to know each other and invite you to please use the chat to introduce yourself. If you're participating in the Green Schools Quest as a school or mentor, you're also encouraged to share a sentence or two about the project that you're engaging in this year. The chat is also where you can insert comments, questions, and resources throughout the event today. We will work to address these during the session and we'll also send a follow-up email that includes a recording of today's event along with resources that have been shared. We're going to kick off things with a brief up project update on two schools, and I always find it helpful to hear about how things are going mid-year, mid-project, and I'm happy to introduce Maggie McCoy first with the Education and Volunteer Coordinator at Missouri Botanical Gardens Earthways Center, and she also serves as a green mentor for several schools this school year. Today, she'll share updates on Bridgeway Elementary in the Pattonville School District. So Maggie, the floor is yours, and welcome all. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so um, working with a lot of great schools this year, uh, but Hope asked me to talk about Pattonville and Bridgeway today. Um, and I am really lucky to work with a teacher who I, I don't know if she needs me as her great school quest mentor because she does so much. Um, but Jeannie Fernandez is our partner teacher um, at that school. So a lot of the focus this year is they are also working towards um, their Missouri Green Schools um, certification and making progress um, in that way. So their Green Schools project that we've been working on has focused a lot on waste. Um, so part of what we done have done so far is look at um, the waste in the cafeteria. So some of that has been doing a waste audit um, of their cafeteria after school, working with their, what they call their K-Kids Club or their Kiwanis Kids Club, um, which is a Kiwanis um, sponsored club that has always existed at Bridgeway Elementary in Pattonville. Um, but Jeannie has kind of taken it to focus on sustainability. So they were doing um, a waste audit in their cafeteria, looking at the amount of food waste that was there and some of those other pieces. So looking for ways they could reduce waste there. Um, they also put together a pumpkin smash um, for after Halloween with all of their pumpkins. Um, so that was really fun. And they had some really cool pictures from that. Um, they had a lot of their administration even come by and stand up on ladders and smash pumpkins. And they were also able to donate some as um, feed to some local farms as well. Um, so that was another way that we're looking at reducing um, waste and turning it into food, um, not just by composting those pumpkins, but also by donating them um, to different farms around the area. And then there's also been a focus on sort of just shifting some of the things that they've typically done as part of that club um, to make them more sustainable. So some things that that club has always done as part of um, what they've done at the schools, like they sponsor a movie night. Um, so maybe instead of having snacks that were all packaged in plastic, they might have snacks that were um, in reusable containers instead. Um, or for their annual clothing drive that they do in December, making um, allowing some clothes to be gently used as opposed to them all having a new tag. Um, so a lot of these things are just small shifts that they're doing, um, but really exploring how they can help to reduce waste and be more sustainable in the school. Um, one of the things that they're looking at for the spring is really enhancing their composting program. Um, so they have a big garden outside and they've done composting out there before, but since COVID, it's there's sort of been a need to reboot that program. Um, so part of what they're doing is having for each teacher that wants one, a little um, worm compost bin within their classroom, but also having a bigger one that'll help to service um, the lunchroom as well. And then having some outdoor composting opportunities as well. So um, they're really doing a big, a big mix of things. Um, I'm kind of excited to see what happens this spring, but they've been doing just absolutely phenomenal work so far um, in terms of integrating sustainability into some different parts of their school. So that's everything I had, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer.
Okay, I've not seen any, but again, as the presentation continues, are we seeing any help? Are you? No. Paul has not joined yet. He is, he just has some uh, technical difficulties going on right now, but he is on his way. Um, Maggie, while we have a few more minutes, I don't know if you'd like to go ahead and also share about Brian Hill. Yeah, so I'm also working with um, an art teacher at Brian Hill and Columbia Elementary, which are in St. Louis Public Schools. Um, and I think I see Zach on the call. Um, so, um, but who's also a, a co-mentor there. Um, but I think a lot of what we've been focusing on there is trying to find a student-driven project um, that really works with climate, um, but also making it very accessible for younger students um, that sort of fits into that art category since our, our teacher that we're working with um, has done a lot of Green Schools Quest projects before, um, but also trying to think about how that can work into the classroom and with students. Um, so what we've really been looking at is thinking about how to study artists who've really talked about climate change and used art um, as a way to even like protest art about climate change um, or looking at people who express um, sort of their fears or hopes or desires around climate um, and really focusing on artists of color and then using that as inspiration for students to sort of create their own um, art pieces within that classroom um, and really having, giving sort of students that voice and talking about their own feelings around climate change or around sustainability issues within their own community um, and being able to use art as a vessel for that. Um, just since it's it's such a great <laughs> way to for students to be able to express um, thoughts about climate um, and also a way that really gives them a voice, um, which I know um, at least particularly in St. Louis public schools and in some of these neighborhoods was a, a concern, um, was making sure that it wasn't sounding too much like, um, you know, this is such a big problem and we're handing this problem off to you, our younger generation, um, and trying to make it sound more like um, that they really had a voice and control um, and some sort of agency um, within that. And so using art as a vehicle to talk about climate change sort of hits all those goals for us. Um, I know that we had also talked about, and I'm not sure where we're at on it, but talked about since they always do, St. Louis Public Schools always has an art show at the zoo in the spring, um, seeing if we can work some of the art that's created as part of that project into that art show. Um, a work in progress, um, but hopefully we'll be able to get some of it there. Thank you so much, Maggie, for those updates and incredible work happening in our local schools. And it really it's very exciting to see and be able to share that out. And especially that being said, um, with our event coming up for celebrating our green schools, please be sure to stay on the lookout for the invitation in May, for our May 3rd event, because we will perhaps have some of these amazing projects on display and communicated too. So thanks again for all the inspiration and the great work underway, Maggie. So as we've kept captured a glimpse of the great work taking place in our schools, we're now going to shift our focus to the theme for tonight, which is climate anxiety. And we're thrilled to be joined by Sarah Ray, author of A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety and How to Keep Cool in a Warming Planet. And chair, she is also the chair and professor of environmental studies at Cal Poly Humboldt. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna turn off my little space heater here so it doesn't distract from the sound. And thanks for having me and for inviting me, Hope, and for that nice introduction and for that little glimpse into what you're doing in your schools. It's um, more gratifying for me to come in with especially a Zoom talk on these topics um, by, via the medium of getting to know who you all are and what you all are doing. And it, it really fills me up with so much excitement and hope. I know that you all are so used to each other, but um, thinking, wow, they're doing that stuff. And that's just so cool. So, okay. So uh, by way of starting out, I wanted to, I don't know what your situation is with how you feel about climate anxiety or climate emotions coming up in any of your classrooms. 
I'm not personally an expert on K through 12. My real area of expertise is around college. I'm really hoping that a lot of what I have to offer can be easily translated into the K through 12. And I'd be very interested in the Q and A to hear from you back from you. Oh, what you said has made me think of doing X, Y, or Z in my classroom. I'd love to hear that. But I find myself often being asked to talk to K through 12 educators. And so I sort of do have a talk <laughs> that is sort of tailored in that direction. And with in consultation with Hope, um, I'm using that talk for today. Um, I also just, I'm, I'm the, on the advisory board for an organization called Climate Mental Health Network. And the Climate Mental Health Network is involved in all kinds of different things, trying to promote and give access to climate mental health resources and information. And they also have a Gen Z advisory board as well. And they've just produced an awesome film that they're trying to promote and have people show in their classes. It's only eight minutes long. And it's something that you might want to think about as just starting right out the gates here in my talk to you with an immediate practical thing you could do in your classrooms the, the number one thing you can do in your classrooms is create space that is unstructured around content. You know, not having like, we have to, something we have to do today, we have to achieve this or achieve that, but just having the space to talk about stuff is super generative and also very healing for young people. And so the film offers an opportunity to open up the conversation. And I wanted to just, you know, entice you into maybe the prospect of filming it or screening it or, or hosting it. The um, youth activists who are part of the film are available for joining in a post screening conversation or joining you and be so they would love to come to schools and talk to students about their journeys. So I'm going to just open up with the one minute, a little more than one minute, um, quick trailer for uh, the film to sort of entice you to pursue it and hope's going to drop the link into the um, chat to, to find more information about it. It's also serving double serving as a segue or sort of introduction to my talk tonight, uh, where I will also have some slides from my slideshow. So for starters, we'll just, I'll show you this uh, really exciting new film that's um, that I'm excited about and I'm sharing the screen and I'm getting a thumbs up from Hope that it's working. Yep, okay, very good. And my sound, I'll get that going too. I'm gonna just play it right now. Last year, the UN described the current climate crisis as a code red for humanity. I feel like I constantly see on the news about unprecedented fires and floods and hurricanes. I think about how people aren't going to be affected by these things equally. It's sort of like picking at me. If you don't do this, then the world's going to end or something like that. On a selfish level, I would like to have children that with what I see at the moment, I'm not super sure it's a great idea. It's becoming more unbearable for folks to be living in this part of the region and seeing how that's going to affect us in the future and what we can do now to stop that. I think my biggest fear would be people will continue fighting against each other and finding things to fear instead of focusing how we can work together and create solutions and think positively and help each other. So um, that was the uh, that was a trailer for this um, eight minute, like I said, eight minute video on climate, mental health, and Generation Z. And uh, to the extent that you think that might be a useful tool, you could probably, uh, when you reach out to look for it, you could probably get a free screening to see if you would like it. And then um, I, they're trying to collect some funds to, to support the making of it. But if you don't have any funds to offer, uh, they will also still share it with you. So please feel free to reach out to them. There's a, um, a link to sign up to find out information on the link that um, Hope has just shared. So, okay, that's a good segue into my talk. And I think, is that now working too, Hope? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so uh, my talk tonight, today, this afternoon for you all is how to keep your cool on a warming planet. 
And uh, I thought of my book, which is here pictured as an existential toolkit for the climate generation. There is so much information out there on how you can help the climate or what you can do to live more sustainably or whatever it is. There's, I mean, by the time I was writing my book, there was a many, many, many of in that genre. And I really felt like there was something missing. My students in college were having despair. They were having nihilism. They were even having suicidal ideation or even suicidal fantasies. Um, the mental health picture around 2013, 14 among young people, as you all know, I'm not preaching to the choir here, was really looking grim and it's still not great. COVID didn't help us. Um, I was feeling like all the tools that I had as an educator, which basically was what I call a scare to care approach, right? The, the only thing I knew how to do was scare my students enough in different categories and topics to get them to care about it and then assume that the work would do work for itself, that they would know what to do with that. And unfortunately, most climate education, most environmental education is still premised on the scare, this sort of scare to care model. And what we're finding, and I'll explore this in more detail in this talk, is that there's, for the most part, it still works in some settings. There's always a rhetorical setting where that works. You know, you think about Greta Thunberg in Davos trying to scare everybody to care. It had a very effective rhetorical moment there. But in general, for young people, what's, what's we're finding is that the mental health uh, the mental health picture that you just saw in that video is actually undermining young people's ability to take action and engage in this work, in large part because we have a society in general, at least in the U.S., that is really quite hostile to, stigmatizes, pathologizes, individualizes any kind of mental health distress around this stuff. And there is almost no language to talk about mental health issues around climate. And so that's what one of the things that that Climate Mental Health Network is trying to address, and I'm certainly trying to address in this work. Okay, so just to give you this sort of flavor of what got me thinking about this topic, in my classes, I started to be able to, started to sort of take notes on what my students were bringing to the class kind of in a pattern, like there was not just one or two, but it was starting to be overwhelming. Um, they were starting to feel like there was no good that they could do for the planet, only impact. Um, so, so for example, if you do the ecological footprint exercise, which basically asks a bunch of questions in a survey format to calculate what your impact is on the planet. Um, this kind of exercise, the intended emotional result of this is guilt. And the thought there is that people out of guilt will then change their behaviors and have less of an impact on the planet. And it turns out that doesn't actually work. And of course, there's this whole critique about it being created by BP to deflect attention away from big oil and make solving the climate pro pro problem a matter of our individual consumer behaviors. This leaves has left my students feeling very, very powerless and also just relatedly that they suck and all of humanity sucks. Right. So there's a lot of discussion when people talk about the climate crisis and all of these classes that they're taking coming up into college. Right. So this is the K through 12 world happening too, also in dominant you know, mainstream media, that all of humanity sucks, that this is a human species problem. Humans are doing X, Y or Z to nature. Humans are inherently greedy, this kind of thing. So sort of painting all of humanity with one brush has made made my students feel really uh, misanthropic, right? Kind of um, what Karen Litvin calls a misanthropic temptation. And there's a, there's a lot of uh, people in, in the category of humanity who have been for millennia, like many indigenous communities, for example, doing a lot of things that are good for the environment. And there are many, many examples of people who are doing great things for the environment, who live in a symbiotic relationship with the environment, who are regenerative with their relationship with the environment. And we don't show those stories as well when we paint every all humanity with one brush, we fall into this um, kind of everybody's evil out there. In recent days, a, a report came out that was fascinating. And if you want me to find a link for this, I'll try to find it for you. But a, a recent study just came out saying that the vast majority of people think that something like 80% of other people around them, like other Americans and in the American context, don't care about climate change, when in fact, a huge percentage of Americans, according to the, the Yale Center for Climate Communication, something like 70% care a lot about climate change. And this gap between our perception of what people think and what they actually think itself causes some problems. And so if we think all of humanity sucks, we can actually spiral into inaction, not doing things, uh, despair that, that can in fact not be ser in service of, of the climate. So there's a real, real cost to thinking that all of humanity sucks. 
My students also feel like the problems of climate change are just so big and interconnected with everything else. And this is now being called the poly crisis. You may have heard that term. Um, and that people individually are just too small and powerless to fix them. And so there's this real sense of powerlessness that I find in my students and, and not just students. This is really pervasive everywhere. And I think, how, how am I perpetuating that in my teaching and how can I correct that? Uh, relatedly, they also have this kind of inevitability, this what's called doomism attitude, like we're just past the point of no return, we're just, you know, trying to plug holes on the sinking ship, what's the point of doing anything, and that's, this can really lead in my students, it leads to the sort of nihilism or disavowal, you know, there's a sense of, um, I know the problems are so bad, but I don't know what to do about them. So I'm just going to carry on with normalcy and, and pretend and get into my screens and just swipe my way out into numbing and distraction. And so that there's a real cost to this attitude as well. Um, Kari Norgard and many other people have, have studied this in a sociological frame, that it is easier to, for most Ameri Americans to imagine the actual apocalypse than a post-fossil fuel society. And again, if what you can imagine, because of what psychologists call the availability bias, what you can most conjure up in your mind as real of the reality is more likely to um, what you're going to put your energy towards to manifesting. And so if from the availability bias, we can conjure up apocalypse more than we can conjure up an imagination for what something better could look like, we are actually going to manifest that fate. And so there's a self-fulfilling prophecy to this lack of imagination, this, this imagination gap. My students feel like their life course is very unclear and that won't be like previous generations. And really relatedly, there's also a brand new film called coming that just came out called The Climate, uh, the Climate Baby Dilemma um, that I was part of the production of that um, centers a lot of the work of Britt Ray and other people who are doing a lot of work around this sort of question of reproduction in this moment of the poly crisis. Uh, many young people, one in four in a recent Lancet study, which I'll, I'll, I'll bring up in a minute, say they don't wanna bring children into this world. In the past, in the early environmental movement, like the 60s and 70s, this was because people felt that um, we wanted to reduce the um, demand on resources on the planet, right? Reduce the impact humans have on the planet. So we cut back on reproduction. That was the argument back in the 60s and 70s based on things like Paul Ehrlich's population bomb and all this kind of population fury fur that happened at the time. But now moment is quite different. I think it's critically important and existentially important to pay attention to that the reason that most young people feel like it's cruel to bring children to this world it has to do with the fact that the world is uninhabitable, that it won't be it won't be a safe place for their children to live. That's a very different argument and that's quite frightening. Um, my students have this kind of eco-nihilistic view that they that means that they can barely show up to class. And these and the, the thing that really got me thinking is we are promising all of our students are going to become climate citizen leaders and all this sort of great stuff, but they can't even show up to class because the content they're learning is so depressing to them that they're in they're they've like lo they're lost, right? And I really got concerned that there was an emotional story to be told here, an emotional set of skills to deal with all of this news, some mindset work um, that needed to be thought about. And that's why I ended up writing my book. I sort of thought my my sort of um immature or early days question was, well, we have all these student learning outcomes in our classes and for the major and for the university, you know, that we tick off and we assess and we say how many of our students are getting that and then they walk across the stage because they're now bearing all of this information and knowledge. But in fact, there's this whole other what we call, you know, we often call the hidden curriculum, but this is an existential hidden curriculum that we don't pay attention to that we're maybe doing some pretty significant and errors in, in our teaching with our assumptions about, about where young people are at and how they come in the door. So it's kind of where my students are feeling. And, and, and recently the, 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 new, the, new, um, the new emotion that has really registered and, and wasn't my experience with students to begin with, but now is, is very much around uh, anger and what is being used in actually the courts, um, human rights courts to create locked cases on the behalf of Generation Z people around the world to um, argue for moral injury to get politicians to change their behavior. So it's fascinating to see how the emotional story of what's happening with young people is translating into material changes in the world. So um, there is a lot of data around uh, concern being higher among youth and this keeps coming out in different layers uh, around 
how many people are being studied, what geographical region they're from, what countries, uh, what's their race. What, I mean, people are getting more disaggregated in how they're asking this question around generation. But overwhelmingly, it is clear in all this data that the younger you are, the more worried you are about climate change. And uh, there are some obvious reasons to think about that, but there's also a, a very interesting story in there too that I won't get into now um, for the scope of this talk. But if you want to talk about it later, we can talk about it. Um, the Lancet uh, article that I mentioned to you, uh, this huge study was the first of its kind, the biggest of its kind, looked at 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25 and found out that nearly 60% of them, um, these are eight different countries around the world, surveyed uh, that said that they were very worried or extremely worried about climate change. More than 45% of those questions said that feelings about climate change affected their daily lives. I want to just point out that the number is smaller in the U.S., just something to, to think about. Three quarters of these people said that they thought the future was frightening and over half felt that humanity was doomed. So this is a real window into a generational um, gap. There's a lot of older people who care a lot about the climate, don't get me wrong, but there's a, a generational story to be had here that's relevant for all of your work with young people. So uh, where am I gonna go from here? I wanna talk a little bit about why emotions are key to climate advocacy in education, especially in this time. Um, a real quick overview of the practices that I try to write about in my book because I wanted to fill this gap. What is that emotional set of skills that they're going to need for this for this time? You know, um, a closer look at one of the strategies called hack the story and then end us on thinking about what could be some breakthrough inquiries you could take to your students or that you might need for yourself to think and shift our attention if you haven't already in your life to what um, some folks in different circles are calling the inner transition. You may have heard of the just transition or transition cities or the transition movement. And this is a kind of play on that word to say, actually the transition is, is internal. Um, as Donella Meadows, the economist, famous economist called these leverage points in the system for ch political change. So what is the leverage point that's in internal to us, right? That's in our minds and our hearts and our, and, and our students' minds and our hearts that might be uh, really uh, leverageable for political change. Uh, again, with this premise that emotions are never private, right? The inner life of ourselves is very much shaped by and shapes our material reality. And, I, and that is a premise that I that in other places I unpack it in detail, but um, won't do that uh, today, just hoping you will believe me on that one. <laughs> okay, so why emotions matter? For one, and you probably are familiar with this research, but maybe you haven't thought about how to bring it into your teaching. Emotions dictate our decision-making, our ability to retain knowledge, our capacity to build community, our ability to come up with how do we know what the most responsible actions are, not just reactive actions, um, and the ability to engage in meaningful work despite setbacks. Um, this is true for emotions more than it is for any kind of data or reason-based appeals. So despite our sort of, you know, American post-enlightenment um, conceit that we are all rational people and I think therefore I am and all that Cartesian kind of dualistic mind is better than anything else. And our students are, are swimming around in that culture and our water and that water. We think of our classrooms as spaces where they're just sort of like, you know, heads not attached to bodies, not attached to hearts and that they're uh, gonna contain this information. We're not therapists. That's something that they do on their own. But in fact, all that mental work that we think that they're doing relies on and is totally shaped by emotions as well. The, the, dis, the um, distance between emotions and reason is not nearly as far as we think. Similarly, the science of emotion shows that different emotions, e.g. fear, anger, joy, hope, all these different emotions, right, shape climate action in different ways and for different types of people. And so how can we be strategic about this? Our students walk into the classroom, they're not all in the same emotional place, right? So how do we use, leverage different emotions in our classrooms, know, figure out what the types of places that they're starting with are and be strategic, more strategic about that? We know, for example, to go back to the ecological footprint, there's a lot of really good research on how, how useful or not guilt is as emotion to, um, uh, to put into play long-term behavior change, right? So how do we use these different emotions to the extent that we can, right? We can't control emotions, right, all the time, but can we create the conditions for different types of emotions and be thoughtful about how our own come into, come into play as well? 
Uh, third reason, the suppression of so-called negative or uncomfortable emotions like grief and anger that is really promoted in especially American culture, dominant culture, actually fuels the problem more, many people are arguing. And this contributes to further fraying of relationships among each other and between us and the more than human world. And so if we think that the what ails us as individuals is disconnection from the human world, disconnection from each other, each other, disconnection from ourselves. Then the result of you know the result of that is all this grief and anger. And if we just keep suppressing that even further, it just creates kind of a, a, a terrible negative feedback loop. And so the kind of pushing of negative emotions into the therapy room, stigmatizing it, mental health being a, a problem, right? And it's not political, right? It has nothing to do with politics, uh, creates actually more of the problem is, is what people are arguing about this. And the kind of key point that I really think about is we often talk, there's a lot of information about how the climate and climate change is going to affect or already is affecting mental health. Even that video I just showed you in the premise of the Climate Mental Health Network is this concept that mental, climate change is going to impact, impact mental health. So we got to get ready for those, you know, to, to deal with that. But the reverse is also equally as interesting and true. Mental and physical health affects our ability to engage in climate justice, in climate work. You know this, you feel burnout, you know how that feels when you show up to the class. And if we start to learn new mindsets about how important our actions are, how much agency we actually have, if we start to combat that sense of powerlessness in our students, we start to realize, well, if what I do matters, then I better show up with all the energy and resources that I can can to do the most that I can and to do it for the longest that I can, because this is going to be the marathon of students' lives. That's why they care about climate change so much more than older people, right? Okay, so what does this all mean for education? Uh, you know, centrality of emotion to education, you probably all have your own theories and principles around this, um, but just to give you a little bit of the people who I pay attention to and think about, Parker Palmer's beautiful book, The Courage to Teach, here's his uh, statements about emotion. Education should overturn the academy's insistence that students suppress their emotions in order to become problem solvers, technicians, whatever it is that they're, you know, we're, we're training them to go do and fix all these problems in the world, right? That the emotions just get in the way of their capacity to do that. He's saying, no, that we shouldn't do that. It would help students to honor and attend to their feelings, especially painful ones like anxiety, fear, guilt, uh, anger, grief, and burnout. Students would learn to explore feelings about themselves, the work they do, and the people with whom they work, and the institutional settings in which they work, and the world in which they live, right? So the feelings about these things shape how they're going to go and do things in those spaces. They would learn that painful feelings are not signs of personal weakness, sources of shame, or irrelevant to the complex challenges of knowing, working, and living. Rather, we should teach students to stay close to the emotions that might become sources of energy to challenge and change institutions. And I think this is a real positive spin on the role of emotions. We often think of them as getting in the way or we, we can't be their therapist or it's got too much work. Or it's too difficult to face that stuff. He's saying, how can we harness emotions to do all the stuff that we want to see in the world? And that's really a big question. Bell Hooks beautifully says, there are times when I walk into classrooms overflowing with students who feel terribly wounded in their psyches. Yet I do not think they want therapy from me. They want an education that is healing to the uninformed, unknowing spirit. They want knowledge that is meaningful. And so this responds to the sort of critique sometimes I hear from educators that they can't be therapists, right? Like if the assumption being that if you're dealing with students' emotions, that must mean you're being their therapist, which is not at all true, right? Emotion plays into everything we're doing, whether we know it or not, whether we're transparent about it or not. Again, it's a hidden curriculum, whether we know it or not. In my book, I talk about this hidden emotional arc of environmental curricula, which has students coming in kind of idealistic and going through these stages. And oftentimes, when professors don't really know what else to do, they will just have the last week be about hope because they will have spent the whole semester giving them all this terrible news, right? And then, well, maybe we'll put some hope at the very last week. And it's it's the end on hope trope um, that I'm pretty critical of, uh, that, that emotion is far more complicated and far more interesting to bring into our work than just thinking about making them feel good, right? What is that impulse we have to just make our students feel good about everything? 
What does this mean for climate education, climate justice education more specifically, not just education? Well, here's a Valentine from one of my students and which was a wake up call to me that maybe I was not, uh, that maybe my strategy of scared to care and giving them all this stuff was all actually bordering on sort of traumatic, right? And the fact of the matter is that environmental education is emotional period, right? There's all kinds of ways to prove that and explain that, but I have the period there just so I emphasize, right? So for example, my student says, I'm not even sure why I chose your, this major. It's so depressing. I'm walking in a world of ghosts. My heart breaks in every class. I feel guilty and hopeless. I fight with my family. I feel so alone. Why isn't everybody as paralyzed by despair as I am? It's kind of, this is how many students feel in their classes when we're just dumping all this stuff on them and, and, uh, and not creating the space for the emotional engagement with that content. So this is why I wrote this book, right? These chapters in the book are strategies uh, that I hope my students and I can work with together. Embracing life in the Anthropocene, get schooled on the role of emotions in climate justice work, cultivate climate wisdom, claim your call, calling and scale your action. This is my student's favorite chapter because it has to do with critiquing their powerlessness. And they, they never thought about these things in that way, that they are in fact much more powerful than they think. And that there's just a, uh, a rejection of a lot of things that they're swimming around in messages and brainwashing from society that tells them that they're powerless. And in fact, they really aren't powerless. Pack the story being less right and more in relation. This has to do with spending less time getting righteous about good arguments and learning more skills about building relationships across differences, especially across differences on attitudes on climate. So that's a really, um, that's, that's a chapter for like, how do you talk to people who don't agree with you? Um, and then ditching guilt, moving beyond hope and laughing more explores the wide range of emotions that are often uh, touted as the most important emotions for climate action. But I'm sort of um, going to critique them a little bit or, or couch them in more of the scholarship on whether they're useful or not. And think about the role of levity, laughter, pleasure, desire, joy in the work of, of climate advocacy, how critical it is. Resisting burnout was my personal favorite chapter, but only after my last chapter, which is feed what you want to grow. And this has very much to do with a very longstanding wisdom tradition that where your mind goes and your energy flows, that grows, right? So there's a sort of the world is full of terrible things. And also the world is full of things that we want to nurture and grow and make sure is protected by those terrible things. And how do we do that work? So feeding what we want to grow. So I just want to focus a little bit on this, this one, right? This is my part of this talk where I just hone in really quickly on, on one chapter, just to give you a flavor of, of what's happening with the kind of neuroscience of this and how it is that we can reframe this, uh, this in our work. So what, why does the story that we live in matter? And I use this picture of the um, Pacific Islanders climate justice movement um, trying to react to the sort of 1.5 degrees Celsius change language that was coming out of the, the COP26, um, previous COP, that the inevitability story of climate change wiping these people off the planet with rising sea levels meant that people weren't actually trying to change the, that those conditions. And it allowed sort of this like vanishing Indian trope to manifest, right? If we start to narrate the erasure of a certain group of people who have not been erased yet, that that actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they're trying to resist that narrative by saying that's not the story we're living in. And that's critical. We're living in a story of fighting, not drowning, right? So to think about stories, I really use uh, Joanna Macy's work. She has this whole uh, pride a part of her work on the work that reconnects is what it's called, called the three stories of now. And she talks about how powerful these stories are in dictating where we put our energies and our actions and our mental health, frankly. Um, the great unraveling story is one that we draw attention to the disasters caused by everything, the derangement and collapse of biological, you know, all these systems, um, sixth grade extinction, hurricanes, earthquakes, floods and wildfires, global warming, nobody has access to water, ecosystems are destroyed, conflicts, military is increased, famine, drought, systemic racism, long term uh, enmities, and of course, you know, just mountains and mountains of almost uh, unmanageable human suffering. So just taking that in that, you know, that's heavy stuff. And that's actually kind of the way I teach my classes, because frankly, based on the news I'm reading and everything I learned in graduate school, this is truth, 
right? This is the reality we live in. And I'm not suggesting that we deny that these things are true or stick our heads in the sand or be Pollyanna about it, but to, to attend to uh, if we're going to actually solve any of these problems, what role does living in this story uh, do for our ability to do that? So let's break it apart. What are some key elements of the story of unraveling? And I use this beautiful image. Uh, you all probably familiar um, with this image, this piece of art in the background of going from blue to red and these scales is supposed to be, um, or the earth's temperature since uh, I think it's from 1750 to 1890 or something like that. Uh, I can remember the exact years maybe someone who knows can throw that into the chat. And it's supposed to sort of give us a sense of the great unraveling, right? The image itself is itself a story, conveys a story of the great unraveling. So what are some key elements? Um, inevitability, right? That, that image of the Pacific Islanders example um, speaks to that. Decline, we had a heyday of things being good. The environment used to be good, humans used to be good, and now things are terrible, right? The great unraveling, um, leads us to the sort of decline narrative, that the scale of the effects of these problems are larger than any one person can control or influence. Overwhelmed, right? When you hear that great unraveling story, you feel like, oh, I can't do anything. No specificity of actors doing the harm and a really pessimistic view about human nature. No evidence of progress or pathways for solutions are ever told in the great unraveling story. And of course, the intended emotional effects of that story are these emotions, fear, anxiety, resignation, anger, apathy, right? So what does it do neurologically speaking? If you're familiar, if you've been trained in sort of trauma-informed education and pedagogy, you're familiar with the window of tolerance or the range of resilience or whatever language you like to use, where if you're in your green zone and you're, all of your chemicals and your body and your mind are all regulated, you can make good decisions in service of your values, even if that means that uh, short-term things are suspended for long-term goals. You can see the horizon uh, in front of you rather than get distracted by the fires that are immediately in front of you. When you are kicked out of your range of resilience, when something triggers you and you get anxious, like a story of the great unraveling comes into your consciousness, you might trick, uh, trip into hyper or hypo arousal where you either totally numb out, which is where a lot of my students are, or you are in hyper arousal, you sort of get inflamed, right? You're all familiar with this. I don't need to tell you the details of this. And I don't need to tell you what that all that does to the body chronic, the chronic stress of being outside of our uh, window of tolerance over time, all the different systems that it has, um, all the effects of it on the body. So what does that do? Well, what this chart does, and I, you, I'm not expecting you to fully grasp it, but there is this kind of feedback loop that we're not always taking into account that climate disruption is going to kick off that reactivity, make us have increased structural stress. So when we're not doing very well in our bodies and minds, when we're outside of our to window tolerance, we're going to actually be not very good in our institutions which then our institutions are not going to be very good at decreasing climate change, which will then result in, guess what, more climate disruption, right? So that's the feedback loop that we're in and why the attention to mental health is so critical as a leverage point in the system. So resilience, on the other hand, this resilience model, I, the idea is, according to Joanna Macy and others, take climate disruption as an opportunity to change the way we've been doing everything. As Naomi Klein says, this changes everything. If everything changes, what happens if our mental, if the climate disruption makes us a, a value our leverage point of our inner resilience to then do the opposite cycle? Um, so that's just really the question. And I, I love this student who describes it in her personal experience. It's exactly that cycle I just described, but from a student's perspective. Depression tells us that we're powerless and culpable, and therefore the only logical response because that's a cognitive dissonance thing, right? I'm, I'm powerless and responsible. What do I do? Can't do anything. I disengage, I turn inward, I eschew connection, a response which actually just serves to reinforce these systems of oppression like racial injustice and capitalism that are the cause of our suffering. Right, so there's a you can see how she's becoming aware here of how that negative feedback loop makes her less equipped to actually change the structures that cause her suffering. What's actually happening here is something that um, psychologists call the pseudo inefficacy effect, and this is a concept I find very interesting for dealing with my students because they they feel so powerless. Well, part of that is because the problem of climate change is always framed as so big and so bad in the great unraveling story. Pseudo-efficacy is defined as 
The idea that people are less likely to offer help if they think the problem is too big for them to solve. The positive feeling of solving even a small part is outweighed by the negative feeling of not solving the whole. So you can see how pseudo-inefficacy can be a self-fulfilling prophecy here, right? That people won't even begin to tackle the problem if it's perceived as too big. This is a bias that we have in our brains that we just give up. Now, why do we have student efficacy? Well, because our bias, another bias in our brains, a negativity bias, makes us focus on how bad things are. And the media then feeds that, right? Because the media in capitalism is required to, by definition of capitalism, get more eyeballs. And the way that it gets eyeballs is because, is, is because of our negativity bias, right? So it produces more negative news. And so therefore we live in the story of the great unraveling, which of course just reinforces that feedback loop as well. So what's happening here? Not all the time. I mean, this is not a this is not a total diagnosis, but we have this kind of thing that's happening. Our negativity bias leads us to living in a story of the great unraveling, which leads to pseudo efficacy and psychic numbing and empathic distress, and often checking out. You know, and that ends up lead, leading to bad things happening for the climate because we we find ourselves powerless and ineffectual. Not all the time, right? It can have an opposite effect for many people. On the contrary, Joanna Macy talks about the great turning where we transition from an industrial growth society to a life-sustaining society, attitude shift, people get more connected, there's solidarity, um, there's all kinds of you know, the good things we're, we're interwoven as we recognize our connection with each other, uh, all of these kinds of things, right? So, um, so examples of this are happening, um, especially among communities who are have not been invested in or have not benefited from this sort of so-called golden era of things being great, right? That there was no great for a lot of communities and they're sort of happy, quite happy to think about um, what could be born into this new world. And we see this oftentimes a radical imagination coming up in things like art, right? As we see here with a mural, this sort of welcoming in of a new world that the normal that we, that coronavirus or COVID wanted us to go back to is not normal other than we normalized greed and inequality and exhaustion and extraction. We shouldn't want to go back to this, right? So this is a real pushing back on the great unraveling story happening here. Valerie Carr also said something similar. What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb, right? So how can we think about um, inviting our students into this generative rebuilding, world building, world creating, uh, you know, moment that, um, that, that, it, that the opportunity offers? And just as a little tiny little tidbit, like if we wanted to revise the art, the piece of art into um, to move it from a great unraveling to a great turning story, we need only put in some possibilities for us to have some agency and control over the outcomes, right? As these words uh, overlaid might do. I mean, it doesn't solve all of the problems, but it's, it's a fascinating sort of interesting moment where people say, oh, actually we're here and we can change that, right? So the key elements of the great story, the great turning, the future is ours to make. Progress is possible. A movement of helpers exists. We're not alone, right? And this leads to this awareness of the collective, which diminishes individualism and alienation. What I do matters. Specific people are to blame, not all of humanity, right? And we can hold them accountable. And then none of this stuff ever makes the news, okay? So anything that your students are consuming, or even you, are probably not going to make you think that this is reality, right? Because of the negativity bias. Of course, the intended emotional effects of the great turning are hope, efficacy, empowerment, solidarity, pleasure, joy, and probably others you can think of. And this is not a black or white. It's not like I'm saying to you, live in this truth instead of the other truth. But to take on the impact of the stories that we live in and think about the emotional effects of, do we want actually to um, embolden young people, our students to do the kind of work required to bring the great turning into reality? Uh, their psychological uh, story that they live in is critical. Donnell Meadows talks about the most important work that we can do to change a system isn't in the you know, symptoms of what we see happening in the world, which is the top of the iceberg here, it's not even in the patterns of behavior, trends over time, which we might then want to change politics for, for example, or system structures, like we want to get rid of capitalism or colonialism or something, right, that connects all of the problems. But actually, what she argues is that the mental modes are the greatest bang for our buck 
of where we can have put, put um, pressure on a system to change the whole thing. That is so empowering to me. If I think that my students and my own mind, our thoughts, our assumptions, our beliefs, our values, our emotional states are the play are the most important front line for change in a system. I feel like, oh, we can we can work with that. That's not like pie in the sky. We can do that work. Paul Hawken puts it another way. The most complex radical climate technology on earth is the human heart and mind, not a solar panel. If we invested in our hearts and minds as much as we're investing in climate technologies, what would that result in? What would that even look like? All right, so these this is where I'm starting to wrap up. Skills and breakthrough inquiries. How do we build capacity in our mind and body for long-term engagement? And here are some sort of breakthrough questions, what, what um, has often been referred to as strategic questions. What would it take to see yourself as efficacious? How would you cultivate a mindset of practices of resilience, engagement, and relationship? What would change your life if you saw your well-being as the front lines of climate advocacy? Second, mindfulness of our emotions so we can know to be our most skillful selves and expand that resilience zone of our behavior and our, our, neuro, our neurological ability, you know, get, get out of our amygdala hijack. So questions here, what does our distress point to? How is capitalism doing its work through you? Can you become more aware of the stories you live in? Cultivate, cultivate wisdom about the benefit of so-called negative emotions and approach our work with equanimity and compassion? A third skill, being more right, being more in relationship and less right. Um, Adrian Marie Brown says critical connection, not critical mass. That's her way of putting it. Uh, community trust and collaboration are the medicine for both social and ecological ailments. What would our work in the classroom look like if we valued relationships more than anything else? This is something I'm still exploring in the classroom. It's really blowing my mind because everything is framed to set up the individual relationship, the individual success, the individual journey. Hack the story and pay attention to your attention. What stories are we consuming? What are we asking others to live in? What else is true? What other possibilities are out there, right? Healing the world with our radical imagination. What, are, what do our students wanna desire about the future? Can they focus less on the stuff that they're afraid of that needs to change and more attention on the stuff that they want to grow and figure out how to nurture those things? And finally, resisting urgency is something I'm spending a lot of time myself thinking about. Um, and here is, you know, how does urgency hijack our minds and hearts and prevent us from doing this work? How is it that we are donating our bodies through the grind culture, the hustle culture of productivity and the productivist imagination to actually undermine our ability. Our perception of time scarcity really shapes our ability to do work with in the world and, and our students too, right? So how, what can we do in our classrooms to untangle some of these things, to bring some of these skills in? I, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you how. I don't I can tell you even which ones are more important. You might not even agree with these things, but what would happen if one of them, you know, started to creep into some of your work a little bit? Um, some of my favorite quotes that you might, you, that your students might like too, I don't know. Uh, Audrey Lord, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Robin Wall Kimmer, even a wounded world is feeding us, even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily and I must return the gift. So this to me is a alternative way out of the whole question, what, does what I do matter? I can't possibly matter, right? This is a completely different way of thinking about it. Clarissa Pinkola Estes wrote this beautiful piece, um, that um, we were made for these times. And in that she writes, ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once, but of stretching out to mend the part that is within our reach. And of course, Trisha Hersey just published this fantastic book called Rest is Resistance. And she talks about rest as a form of resistance, for example, because it disrupts and pushes back against capitalism, white supremacy. Bio Kamalafe writes similarly, this kind of paradoxical statement, well, only paradoxical to my mind frame as a Western trained person, the times are urgent, we must slow down. 
And finally, I love Adrienne Marie Brown's work. I always am talking about her. We have to make justice the most pleasurable experience humans can have. And so this shift of thinking about how do we make this work pleasurable? How do we use more carrots and less sticks? How do we combat the negativity bias of what we're doing? How do we have students think about abundance, not time scarcity, right? All of these kinds of questions are just the different ways of thinking about these different tools that come to us from many, many, many years and generations of social movements and indigenous traditions and wisdom traditions. This is not new information, um, but I appreciate your time. I'm going to end there. These are some of the things I'm up to. I think Hope is going to um, let you know in the, in the chat a link to what uh, a crowdsource project that was funded by um, the Rachel Carson Center uh, that Jennifer um, Atkinson and I and also Ellen Kelsey produced a website of crowdsourced teacher tools for centering emotions in Edu climate education uh, that's called the Existential Toolkit. And Jennifer and I are, um, are also about to pr produce a book that's a similarly kind of crowdsource edited book on uh, existential centering emotions in climate education. Um, we also offer, I offer through with a colleague, something called the Climate Wisdom Lab, which we do sort of an immersion, like a one to two day immersion in some of these ideas, how they apply to what you would do and how you might make changes. Um, and then I'll, I, I do teach a mindfulness class too on, on these practices. So I'll, um, I'll stop there and stop the share. And I, I know I'm probably over time, but I'm hoping... <laughs> We still have time to talk and thank you for your attention. Oh my gosh, Sarah, thank you. What an incredible presentation you've shared. And I, my notes and notebook is just like, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm like, no, don't do that slide yet. But this was fabulous. And I can't wait to get it out to everyone. Um, Sarah, the information resources you shared are so valuable as we work to educate and engage youth in climate action while also being cognizant of the impacts the subject can have on our general well-being. Again, um, we're going to be following up with an email. I did want to reach out though at this point to see, does anyone have any questions for Sarah that you'd like to provide in follow-up to her amazing presentation this evening? Okay. Okay. Um, if it does come to your mind again, please post it in the chat and we will definitely um, share it with Sarah later on. Um, in conclusion, though, we do want to highlight our friend Paul. So Paul has been doing some work um, at Central High School in Springfield, Missouri, and is serving as their Green Schools Quest lead for this year. So Paul, if you would like to, we'd love to hear what is going on in Springfield with your kiddos in high school. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, well, so in Springfield, kind of the biggest thing that I'm really excited about at our school right now. So it's it, I focus mostly on gardens. Um, and so we have a lot of gardens here at school and we focus a lot of effort on on developing those. And um, a person came to me a little while back and and really brought this program to me. It's been a whirlwind. And I actually got an email today, but I haven't even had time to look at it. So I'm kind of curious what it says. But basically, she is trying to set up a program with us at Central um, to advocate for minority students and, and people from marginalized communities that will to try and get them to go into agriculture, but sustainable agriculture for a living like to make it possible for like people that grow up in the middle of Springfield um, to sort of imagine themselves as farmers. And, and she's starting with microgreens and then she's uh, she's going to build on, hopefully, I mean, she's trying to get a grant, but is assuming everything goes right, then we're going to start here at central and start by growing microgreens and try and get them into our cafeteria um, which I think would be great just to have some better nutrition, right? But then um, who knows where it's going to go from there. So she's her she'd really like to see it expand to most of the schools in Springfield, and we're going to try and help her do that. But also um, we're just going to, I don't know, kind of see where it goes. So, so we've done a lot of work kind of putting it on paper saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it. This is what we can do. This will be great. Trust us. Give us money. And we'll see if that happens. Um, if it doesn't, if, you know, if it doesn't come out exactly the way she looks at it, I still think we can make something work. We just have to kind of play with it. But, 
uh, we have a greenhouse on the roof that I think is a perfect location for us to do that in. Um, so that's kind of the big exciting thing that I'm, I'm not exactly sure where it's going to go, but that's our hope. Our other two primary projects is in that same greenhouse, we're trying to get a hydroponic system going. And we have, we had a hydroponic system going and it was going just fine. Um, but somebody else was kind of doing it and then they left and uh, I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> I'm uh, getting, I'm, I'm I really, I shouldn't say I, because it's not really me. I have some students that wanted to get it up and running and wanted to make that one of our big projects this year. And so they're, they've been cleaning it up and trying to figure out what we don't have that we need and how to get it going. You know, we try and run it and it leaks everywhere. And then we're trying, okay, what do we got to do to fix this? So it's kind of a problem solving thing, uh, trial and error thing, sorry. But that's one of our big projects. And then our other big, and when I say big, we're not talking humongous. They're just, I think they're nice bite-sized projects. But then the last bite-sized project is um, outside in one of our gardens. We we ha we made like, we call it our classroom garden. So teachers can bring kids out there and do different things. And we build a chalkboard that's covered. And, and so, you know, it's a place where the teacher can still write stuff or kids can write stuff and it's got kind of an ugly slanted roof on it right now and the the thought was always to turn that into a rooftop garden just to see how to do it right and so this year i've got a couple students that are really really interested in taking that project taking the lead on that project and so that's what we're doing right now is we're sort of making the plans for how to build you know how to adjust this to make it a safe effective won't rot in a year rooftop garden and then figure out what to grow in there and uh and kind of how to show it off and so those are our three big new projects that we're doing um we you know like i said we have 24 by 12 raised beds that we're growing lots of food in we've got lots of ornamental gardens we've got a big giant herb garden so now we're just like i was late getting here because i was just going to get seeds so um you know I, we're right in the thick of it. So that's kind of what's going on. Sounds pretty amazing. That's awesome, Paul. And I love all the projects and that the kids are the ones facilitating it with your guidance. And that's incredible. And we can't just see, can't wait to see the journey to come for you all. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you all once again for joining us us this evening for an amazing presentation by both Maggie and Paul, as well as Sarah, and opening our eyes to the possibility of tomorrow and making a better world for all. So we can't thank you enough for joining with us this evening, and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you all for attending.